All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to your Liberty Radio, the most listened to pirate radio station, broadcasting live once again from the land of endless summer. We bring you a very special Thursday broadcast today. Not special because it's on a day that uh, we're usually silent as far as the airwaves are concerned, but special because of the guest that we have joining us in the Manufacturing Reality Studios today. Now, those of you who uh, are more, shall we say, conspiratorially minded in the audience may already be familiar with the lovely young lady that is joining us today in case you are not Uh, She has a young YouTube channel that has already been making waves in uh, the mainstream circles, we might say, Uh, so much so to the point that now uh, she's forbidden from uh, streaming for uh, at least the next few days. We are very pleased today uh, to... uh, I guess, feed a little bit or scratch a little bit of that itch for Dana from the Rotting Jewels channel over there on the YouTubes. Dana, welcome to Liberty Radio. Thank Thank you for having me. Oh, well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I think this is going to be a a very value-packed episode of Liberty Radio, and uh, we certainly appreciate you Uh, gracing us with your uh, presence as well as your knowledge today. Well, like I said, thank you for having me. I uh, definitely had the itch to uh, stream and come on and talk about anything, everything. So yeah, I've been looking forward to it. All right. Well, let's go ahead and dig right in then. I became aware of your work uh, literally just a couple of weeks ago and if memory serves, it was because somebody else that I followed on Twitter had retweeted one of your tweets. And if, again, if memory serves, it was the episode where you started digging into one Dr. Lewis Jollyan West. Um, what was it? I mean, Jolly West has long been a popular subject of mine ever since I began learning about uh Programs like MK Ultra, like Chaos, like COINTELPRO, uh, all the black programs that the intelligence agencies are running, but they don't want the public to know anything about, even though they want the public to keep funding them. Uh, what was it that caused you to begin looking into the career of uh, Jolly West? So specifically, I had done a well, we had started a series on Zero Dark Tony's channel, and it was for the ex-Scientology community. And I was just going to kind of go through the story of, uh, you know, group mind control, cults, things like that. I was going to talk about G.H. Estabrooks and hypnotism. I was tr- going to try to lay the foundation. And uh, I had started specifically with the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, which obviously Jolly West was a board member, as well as Dr. Margaret Singer. And uh, someone left a comment stating that how dare I speak against their hero, Margaret Singer, and the satanic panic's not real, and I'm feeding into a QAnon narrative, and I'm a dangerous spreader of misinformation. Oh, no. Then, yeah, I was like, hmm, that's a red flag. And uh, the next day I woke up and there was a Substack and a podcast interview of a well-known ex-Scientology author, uh, basically singing the praises of the late Dr. Jolly West, his dear friend. And I said, oh, oh no, (laughs) Uh, we've got something going on here. And so I just kind of started slow and... I think over the next three or four days, the author would go on another show, write something else, and I would follow. I've reached out to him. Uh, He does not want to talk about a lot of Jolly's career. 
Um, I think part of the reason for that is that Jolly wrote the recommendation letter for this man's book, the book that has made his career. Margaret Singer also funded his book because it was going to go bankrupt. Um, so there's, there's some strange ties and none of these people uh, have retracted or tried to refute me factually. Seems that people get really weird when you start talking about CIA doctors and the False Memory Syndrome Foundation. So I think I know what's going on. Uh, you know, you can kind of uh, see the forest from the trees, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the um, what you were speaking about as far as the recommendation letter uh, for the book that uh, made the career of this individual, that's what we refer to in the business as leverage. And when you can uh, gain that advantage over anybody, friend or foe, uh, there are definitely people in this world who will use those tools to their advantage. And it sounds like you've yeah. been experiencing a little bit of that here recently. Yeah, well, uh, you know, I used to be really big into true crime. So I knew about uh, L. Ron Hubbard and Scientology sort of from that aspect. And, you know, a brief bit of Crowley and Jack Parsons. Um, but I didn't know that uh, specifically, you know, Jolly West was an outspoken critic of Scientology, apparently. Um, so now I'm going through L. Ron's history, specifically going through all of his FOIA documents um, and trying to lay out the argument against what this author is stating because. This author only wants to focus on Tom O'Neill's book, Chaos. Um, I'm not like a Tom O'Neill fangirl, but I do think that Tom O'Neill did a good job. Um, I don't fault him at all. <laughs> uh, and it, he was very honest about how long it took him. Um, but, you know, he basically mocks Tom O'Neill uh, about, you know, Jolly being his white whale that he's never going to catch. Um, and only wants proof of Jolly and controlling Manson won't talk about the Violence Prevention Center, won't talk about the False Memory Syndrome Foundation, um, you know, says that Jolly and Margaret Singer were brainwashing whistleblowers in regards to the Korean uh, repatriated POWs, which I have shown uh, that is a lie. That is just a flat out lie. Um, so I have to kind of go through all of these things and I'm starting to see and trying to lay out the argument. Um, that I think that L. Ron and Jolly is what we would call a case of controlled opposition. Hmm. Playing both sides against the middle. Yep. Yeah. So what exactly is it that has led you to this conclusion? The similarities. So, and similarities in regards to mind control specifically um, and behavior modification. So, you know, I'm, I was working, you know, through Tavistock before I got uh, banned, but, you know, looking at pre, pre world, you know, right around World War I, but before World War II, they're talking about this behavior modification and how do you get group control moving from the individual to the group. Jolly is at the first uh, Tavistock AK Rice Institute meeting uh, that took place in the United States. I've tracked him down specifically to that meeting. What year um, was that? And 1965. And that is the longest thing on his resume. That's his longest tenure out of everything. Um, and there's, there's a lot of weird stuff about the rest of his resume that correlates with the Rockefeller Foundation Committee hearing from 1946, where they're coming out and talking about, you know, how they're going to move forward with their plans for a new world post-war. Um, as far as the connections, you know, when you look at El Ron and the people that have left and the people that you see who are kind of the public faces, I would say, whether it's on TV or on YouTube, uh, they really just talk about, you know, money, money, money. El Ron and Scientology and David Miscavige, they just want your money. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. Why won't you guys talk about his occult ties? Why don't you guys focus more on, you know, Jack Parsons? And 
his weird stuff with Sarah Northrup and all of the blatant connections to intelligence. Now, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, it's completely just like a CIA op sort of thing, but he, he was tied to intelligence in one way or another. There's multiple ties there. And there were multiple angles to it because I'm sorry, it's not just some crazy cult that, you know, thinks that, you know, Xenu, whatever. I'm so not well versed in Scientology's practices, but I think that they have done a fantastic job at fooling the public. And I think that part of that is because of that show that Leah Remini was on and Mike Rinder. And I don't care if, you know, people get upset about this. I'm sorry. Um, you know, that show was on for how long? And she's just now filing a lawsuit against mm. the church. I think that that's kind of bizarre. And, you know, I live not that far from where they own an entire city, the church. Uh, so this idea that, you know, it's just this weird kooky cult and people's families can't get out. I'm sorry. There's a lot of very specific practices, especially in the uh, Hubbard, the Hubbard uh, Dianetics Research Foundation, which predated uh, the Church of Scientology, which I'm reading for people, um, that literally matches Jolly West research almost to a T when he was at uh, the University of Oklahoma doing experiments for Sidney Gottlieb, uh, I think specifically in uh, subproject 48 or 46. Um, and I could be wrong, but it's one of the sub projects to a T. These things are almost identical. And this idea of auditing, as far as I understand, uh, you're basically getting blackmail to hold over somebody so that they don't leave. And it's really weird that within this ex uh, Scientology community specifically, you have a lot of former auditors and some of them are very high level and they're coming onto YouTube and they're talking about covering up very serious crimes against children and getting donations. And nobody can tell you where any of these donations are going. You're not allowed to ask questions. So I think that it's really bizarre. It sounds really bizarre. It also sounds like the perfect type of structure that you would want to set up if, again, uh, and, and you'll notice that I, I tend to uh, harp on things a little bit, but I do it more for the benefit of the audience than anything else. But uh, it sounds like they were trying to, again, set up a machine that would provide them with leverage over a very specific set uh, of individuals from the larger group, those, of course, being the uh, the people who would uh, come to adhere to the tenets of Scientology, which we now basically refer to as Hollywood or the uh, the folks that we're told we're supposed to put up on a pedestal and look up to. Um, I don't know. It, does does that sound like similar to what you've been thinking about it or am I completely off base with that? No, I don't think you're completely off base. I've even brought up, you know. So you have these auditors that are coming on and, you know, there's different levels. I don't know how all of it works, but some of them are very high, former high ranking, and they're talking about the most heinous things. Um, but then you have the hosts of the show covering specials about, you know, where they're taking super chats for John Travolta questions and Tom Cruise and, you know, this big focus on the Danny Masterson trial. Um, there's also an individual, uh, his name is Tony Ortega. He's a uh, sort of journalist, I guess you would say. Uh, and he writes for the ex-Scientology community. He's never been in. Apparently, there's been multiple reports, so apparently uh, he doxxed, harassed, and threatened uh, some of the Jane Doe's from the Masterson trial so that he could get the coverage out super fast. He also has a really shady track record. I don't care for him either, but all of these people kind of run within the same circles. Um, and I'm like, if you are running a charity organization, which is public record, so we're allowed to ask questions, right? Um, and you say that you're helping people. My concern is always the children. However, you're still helping vulnerable people because they're leaving a cult, you know, um, on top of if they're bringing children with them. 
uh, why are you guys talking about celebrities and taking, you know, only reading super chats uh, and focusing on those types of questions? Because celebrities are completely irrelevant, you know, or are you guys trying to divert attention away? And, you know, me and Tony started that. And I mean, their whole little community is like self imploded, you know, within like two weeks. Oh, wow. um, and no, nobody will answer questions. Nobody, even when I provide receipts, nobody will answer anything. So I think I know what's going on, but we'll just kind of let it play out. Okay. Let's, let's jump back to the dialectic between Hubbard and West. Uh, Cause I think that that might be something worth fleshing out a little bit more. If we assume, um, and again, as for anyone listening at home, assumptions are dangerous, but in the case of hypotheticals, they're necessary. So if we assume that Hubbard and West were opposite poles of the dialectic, what do you think is the synthesis that they were meant to create? I think the cohesion because I do see it as a cohesion. And I don't give either man credit for being smart enough or having uh, enough forethought, but it, everybody has their handler, right? So whoever's, whoever was in charge of them is someone that we probably don't know exist and right. they're probably not here anymore. Um, and those are the people that, you know, I argue if you see somebody, they're not the one you need to uh, be concerned about. It's whoever's holding their puppet strings. But with... Scientology specifically, and then you have Jollyon and MK Ultra, among other things, and they were both in the service, different, uh, you know, different parts, but they were still both in the service. And then you have this counterculture movement coming. And then also, like, I would say the, I would say the weaponization as far as the government and religion, kind of that ramping up. It's the ex-cult, anti-cult, and then cult turned into government, federally recognized, free, protected, you know, free from punishment, I mean, um, free from, you know, any sort of financial uh, harm, uh, any sort of financial duty, nobody asks questions, right? And, but you know that people are going to leave, you know, there's going to be problems. That's why I pointed out the Patty Hearst case with Donald Dufries, because they were doing MK Ultra at Vacaville with Dufries, right? And I mean, they were talking about crazy stuff, like taking out parts of people's brains that they thought were violent. He's the one that ends up kidnapping Patty Hearst, does all that terrible stuff to her, and then oh no, who's coming to save the day? It's Jolly West, Margaret Singer, Martin Orne, and Alan Dershowitz. And it's like, okay, so this looks like a cover-up to me because you guys did that to Dufries. That's your program. You got to take credit for it. We don't get to cherry pick uh, which doctors were involved because they were all involved in one way or another. And we see what happened to her. I read some of her book on one of my streams. And so I think that they knew that they had to really ramp up this uh, cults are coming, hide your kids, hide your wife. That's what I think Patty Hearst was. I think that Patty Hearst was kind of uh, what some might call like a dog whistle. Mm. Like, hey, get the site community on board. We need to ramp up this sort of fear porn about cults because this whole brainwashing thing might go bad and it might come back to us. That's just my two cents. That makes sense though, uh, especially from an operational standpoint. Uh, if you have some sort of idea that whatever the operation is that you are going to be carrying out, if it has the potential to uh, break or potentially destroy people psychologically, that is fallout that you're going to have to deal with at some point down the road. It might not be tomorrow, it might not be next week, but the blowback is going to come and you have to be prepared for it and be able to take care of it. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, cause you know, when I was looking through the false memory syndrome foundation and the 
ex-cult milieu because they are tied together Mm -hmm. it's really weird all of the experts and i do mean all for anybody that's wondering uh even the very famous ones that are often cited uh, none of them have ever testified in court successfully um one of them who is the most commonly cited has never actually testified in court as a professional witness and i've spent a long time looking can't find anything um these you know cia doctors they say that they've testified in court and they have. The only one that almost stuck successfully was Margaret Singer, but then it went to an appeals court and they threw it out because uh, her whole focus, uh, all of their focuses, uh, it's junk science. It's all junk science. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, if you read it for yourself and you have any amount of discernment inside of your mind at all, uh, you figure that out pretty quickly, or at least I did. I don't know. I could be an exception to the rule. It sounds like you figured it out uh, pretty quickly as well. So, well, oh, go people, ahead. people have a hard time with that though, because you know, there's, there's people that, and I understand it's difficult when you find out that your hero is not a good person, but that doesn't change the past and you can't really do anything about it. You just have to move forward. And people have a really hard time with that. Mm. Uh, and so there are people that whether it's uh, white knuckling, you know, their perception of the world and wanting to ignore it, or they don't see it. That's why I try to find court records because the judge will usually give all the legal jargon. And then at the end, they'll say, this is crap. And that makes it pretty cut and dry. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's, that's what it tends to come down to, especially in, uh, the country that we live in today, uh, that is yeah. ruled by the letter of the law, regardless of whether or not that has anything to do with justice. Uh, so, all right, let's add another dimension, uh, into this and let's start talking about Tavistock. Um, all right, you pointed to uh, 1965 being uh, a pivotal year for Jolly West and Tavistock. Was that the beginning of his relationship with Tavistock, or was that the end of it, as far as we know? That was the beginning. Okay. So that for his, his decade of service to the Tavistock Institute, uh, whatever that may entail, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to find out a few juicy details on that, um, but that ran from 65 to 75. Yep. Which is interesting because it was also in uh, 1975 uh, when the blow up with the church committee happened. And we had, uh, as a result, the restructuring of the intelligence services because of, among others, the MK Ultra program. Yeah. Isn't that interesting how these things all kind of come together and then MK kind of goes underground. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they ended it, of course, you know, the CIA said that sure. they, they ended the program. They ended the experimentation. The experimentation sure. stopped in 1975, ladies and gentlemen, uh, that is a matter of congressional record. So when you, Ooh, Ooh, I let, let me hold on. Cause, <laughs> cause this one, uh, Ooh, it uh, certainly took the wind out of my sails. So I, and I haven't finished it, but 1974. Good so year, by the way. 1974, two years they had, and they didn't get it finished. They had two years, but no, there, there was no research ethics that uh, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare was holding any facility to, including children. So it was free game. Interesting. And then let's see, when was, uh, when was it restructured into the Department of Education? Do you remember? Do you know that right off the top of your head? No, I don't. All right. The, the premise of the congressional hearing, so it was about bodily, uh, I think it was human rights and 
constitutional rights as far as your mind and your body. And a lot of it was focused on, strangely enough, uh, mind control, behavior control, behavior modification. It's 700 pages long, separate from the MK Ultra hearings. And um, it actually talks about the Violence Prevention Center with Jolly West. But um, yeah, the, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, I always the little moniker for it always confuses me. Mm -hmm. um, they were supposed to have practices and standards as far as for facilities, for prisons, children's hospitals, the like. Uh, they didn't. And then they also got busted funding and monitoring their own experimentation programs. Interesting. All right. So I'm actually uh, on the Wikipedia page for the United States Department of Education right now. And it says that it began operating on May 4th, 1980, having been created after the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare was split into the Department of Education and the Department of Health and Human Services by the Department of Education Organization Act, which President Jimmy Carter signed into law on October 17th, 1979. Uh, I have a feeling if I were to continue reading that, which I'm not, I'm not going to torture anybody by doing that, but I have a feeling that uh, that law that President Carter signed was likely an outcome uh, of this investigation that you're talking about. Because that's, that's typically what happens in Congress when they do an investigation. They're like, oh, we uncovered all of this malfeasance and, and all of these laws that were being broken by the department. We're not going to punish anybody, but what we are going to do is we're going to give them more money and we're going to compartmentalize them further. Because that's going to yeah, solve the problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's when I get my stream back. I'll pick back up on it. Cause it, like I said, it's 700 pages and I just kind of have to choose what I'm going to talk about to, for time's sake, but it's completely infuriating that this is public record. You can go online, get it from a dot gov yourself. And you see, because Jolly's proposal for the violence prevention center, he was doing that. It just wasn't called that, but they were doing it in prisons at UCLA, that testimony is in there. And they were doing it to kids. They were doing all kinds of stuff to kids. Um, and they were running very weird programs through foster care and child protective services, which is obviously a big problem today. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's it's a lot, but no, MK Ultra. They say it ended, but how many sub projects were never declassified? And uh, those dates, we don't know. So. I think that there's a lot of sub projects that are still going on right now. Oh yeah. Well, it, that was, uh, my way of being a little bit, uh, facetious. Um, you, you may That's eventually, fair. yeah, you may eventually pick up on the fact that I have a very dry wit. Uh, but when, <laughs> when I corrected myself by saying that the experimentation ended, uh, as, uh, soon as the church committee happened, uh, that was not a lie. And that is actually a matter of congressional record that the experimental phase of MK Ultra uh, ended around about 1972. It was after the church committee that it went to full operational mode. Um, and folks listening along at home are going to have to do their own research to, uh, to verify that. Um, but let's get back to Jolly West and Tavistock because this was the thing that... Uh, when you revealed it absolutely blew my mind because it was, it was literally like one of those puzzle pieces that you've been trying to find for so long and it suddenly just drops in your lap and the picture just opens up in front of you. Uh, that was kind of the effect that it had for me. What did coming across that information do for your worldview? So I've, been kind of uh noited so to speak you know that's like the twitter you know noited paranoid about everything but putting that into perspective because tavistock was around for at least 45 years prior to that because what they started technically 1920 he starts 1965. So yeah, so 45 years prior to that. 
And in his testimony that I haven't covered yet, uh, in regards to some controversies with uh, veterans affairs, he states himself when he was in the service that he was consulting at our bases all throughout the world. So I don't know if he was at Tavistock over in the UK. There's a very strong argument that he probably was and that that's why he was selected. Um, Because I do think that uh, to an extent he was groomed. But the whole premise of Tavistock and Jolly's career and his studies and his experimentation uh, and his involvement in so many pivotal points in just our history here in the United States. Uh, everything has just kind of clicked for me. It's all clicked. And I think that A, Jolly's the most heavily redacted out of all of the doctors. Why is that? That's very weird. Mm-hmm. Um, B, obviously it's for a reason. Jolly and Tavistock it lays it all out that that is the uh that is the machine so to speak in my opinion because it's weaponizing uh psychology it's weaponizing uh mental health or as uh jr reese put it in the shaping of psychiatry by war mental hygiene but we can't call it mental hygiene because people might get the wrong idea because that's associated with eugenics so we need to call it mental health and common sense um once you realize the impact that these people have had on our world today and even our vernacular and things that were not in the vernacular prior to them coming on the scene uh you just see it's all a big game. It's a big game to them. And we are all very expendable. Yeah. Uh, I cannot disagree uh, with any of that based on my own research. And I think that you are uh, correct in that if, if you, if somebody wants to learn about how the 20th century came to be shaped the probably the easiest place to start looking into how that was possible is by looking into Jolly West and Tavistock because it is going to open so many other doors that you most people can't even conceive of some of the places that these two topics are going to lead them Uh, and you just kind of have to go on your uh, on your own journey and find that stuff out for yourself much like Dana uh, has done a very phenomenal job of here. Um, So kind of on a personal note, Dana, uh, and again, I'm not trying to to embarrass you or have a gotcha moment or anything like that. Um, This is out of genuine curiosity. Is this research for uh, the sake of scholarship or do you have a more personal reason for engaging in it? Very personal reason. Um, I'm an ICU nurse. I worked uh, on the road during COVID um, and I watched uh, a lot of really terrible things happen and also watched the very serious propaganda, um, you know, and I did everything that I could, got a doctor fired, (laughs) but, uh, and one place ended up on on the news and people uh, were arrested, but watching the propaganda and waking up before going to work and the CDC has changed their guidelines for healthcare workers PPE like five times before I go in that night because I used to work night shift. Um, The stuff with Fauci and his whole little uh, mind war games on TV and remdesivir and Uh, The truth matters. And I think that that was sort of a litmus test. And I understand as far as uh, the thing that, you know, nobody's really supposed to talk about that's not causing any problems for anybody. Um, Just totally normal. I know that there were a lot of people that were put into really what they felt, and I believe them was an impossible situation. And I don't fault them at all. Um, I have friends that did not want to have to go through with that. Uh, and, and they did, they felt that it was what they had to do for their family. I understand. 
I'm trying to make the point that they're going to do it again and it's probably going to be soon. Um, and it's not me trying to, uh, you know, do fear porn or anything like that. I think that's what uh, mainstream news is for. They're, they get paid to scare people and confuse people. Um, I'm trying to show that this is not the first time, won't be the last time. And look at all these other really crazy ways that they've done this, you know. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, I think that uh, you are correct in your assertion that uh, they are going to do this again because it does appear just from following the trends in the media currently that they are leading back to another uh, mass formation type of event where they try to get everybody's attention focused on one thing so that they can then direct people in whatever direction it is that they want them to go. And unfortunately, it looks like this time it is going to be to lead the mass populace into, well, the, the digital pen and then shut the door uh, behind all of them. And the thing that I'm most curious about at this point is, because uh, again, you can agree or disagree with me uh, on that, and that's fine. I, I don't care one way or the other. But there are people who have been able to figure out the game well in advance, people like you, Dana, people like me, um, and people far smarter than the both of us have already mm -hmm. figured all of this out. They're still going to be on the outside of that control structure. So one of the things that I've been wondering about, uh, especially for the last several weeks, as you know, we're, we're approaching this next event, whatever it happens to be, like, what are they going to do about those people beyond the walls that they can't control? How are they going to, uh, how are they going to spin that so that the people who are still duped uh, aren't, aren't going to be lured out of the digital control structure? Is it, are we just going to disappear? Are we just going to be erased from you know, the, from the record books, from media, from everything. I've, I've wondered that too. Cause you know, it's like at the flip of a switch, right. They could mm -hmm. just turn it off and that's it. Um, and it would be, you know, technically so simple, even though that is an oversimplification. Um, at the end of the day, it is, it is about going digital. I don't think that you're wrong at all. People can disagree, but we can all look at uh, Julian Huxley's writing and uh, back for UNESCO in 1946, specifically uh, paid for by the Rockefellers, mm -hmm. where they're talking about transhumanism and this transfer over to, uh, you know, merging man and machine. Uh, that's not a conspiracy at all. And that is what they're doing. That's what they're trying to do. Um, something that is interesting, and I don't have the date on me, and I've wondered this though, is I know that they've done it in Russia is they did an experiment where they put a whole town to sleep through uh, EMF waves. And it's just this, you know, random little study and it's just the town that went to sleep. And so I'm like, well, is that, is that what they're going to do? I don't know. And, and, and everybody was fine, but they had uh, amnesia. They didn't remember. They just, you know, lost that period of time. Uh, but I mean, people get really weird when you start talking about that kind of stuff. Uh, that seems to be a little bit too far over the edge. And I get it, but I would just encourage people. The documents are out there. You can mm -hmm. read it for yourself. This is where your tax money goes, seriously. Yeah. Uh, and it's been going there for a really long time. And yes, uh, they can put an entire town to sleep mm -hmm. with uh, some radio waves. It's yeah. really crazy. They can actually, uh, I believe it was uh, 1970 is when they were able to uh, verifiably document uh, this capability, but they can actually implant memories uh, through radio waves and have been able to do so for several decades. Again, that's not me saying it, folks. This is, uh, this is actual government documents uh, that state yeah. that this is the capability that they have at the time.
Yeah, I there's there was some podcast that somebody sent me and I got so mad I like threw my phone, but it was a it was a DARPA executive like a former mm-hmm. DARPA executive and they're like, if you're ever walking down the street or walking on the sidewalk and you suddenly have a brilliant idea, it might be a radio implanted or a remote implanted memory from one of us and then they just talk about how they can do this and I'm like, this is not cool. This is a violation of your bodily autonomy and your, your freedom to think Mm -hmm. for yourself. Literally. It's not cool. It's not a good idea. Uh, I just, but people, you know, it's fine. There's some people that are unfortunately going to keep their head down and walk themselves into slavery. Mm -hmm. And there's just nothing that you can do. Well, there's, uh, there's nothing we can do about it right now, unfortunately. Um, I, I think you're 100% correct in that. Uh, it was not always the case, however. If, you know, if folks want to spend a little bit of time looking into the history of the American educational system, uh, and of course, one of the best ways uh, to do that is by consulting the works of John Taylor Gatto, uh, as highlighted uh multiple times over his career uh, by uh, Richard Grove, uh, you can see that there was a very clear plan in place uh, to install an indoctrination system through the American public education system. And they did a very good job of it uh, because it's been in place for well over 100 years at this point. And it does exactly what it was designed to do, which is produce interchangeable humans for whatever system uh, they need those parts for uh, at the time. Um, and, and the problem with that, that, that I've discovered throughout the course of my life is that that indoctrination is very difficult to break once it is deeply ingrained. It takes a long time. And if the individual is not willing to do the uncomfortable work that is necessary to uh, retrain their brains, there's not really anything that you can do. And that's, you know, uh, like you said, that's kind of the situation that we find ourselves in today. We have uh, fellow human beings, brothers and sisters, walking around on this planet that unfortunately, you know, we don't have any choice but to view them as an empty vessel because that's what they have decided to be. And that's what they are comfortable being. And I don't know how to counter um, that. Here's it's hard because you want to like run around and like shake everybody. Right. And be like, please just give me five seconds of your time. I'm trying to help you. I swear. Um, And you're absolutely right as far as the education system. I mean, the Rockefellers, most of their money from 1946 and they state in 1901 was all going towards our education system. Um, We were modeling a lot of what Tavistock was doing as Mm -hmm. well um, in regards to, uh, and they even say, uh, you know, welfare is a weapon and we need to get into the school system. You know, uh, it is, it is good and it is right that we should go there. Uh, So you're absolutely right that their plans have played out exactly as they should. And I think personally, and this is my conspiracy, but I think that the timing of COVID was very interesting in regards to Epstein, because Mm -hmm. I feel like Epstein broke a lot of people's brains. If that was their first peek into uh, that sort of, I wouldn't even say dark underbelly, but for some people, a dark underbelly of society um, and Mm. the global power structure uh, because their brains were broken and then COVID locked them into their house. And so then they were locked at home with a broken brain, trying to figure out how these people who had enough money to have an island to do that. And it was people that they saw on TV, people within their government, people that Maybe they had uh, some affection for in some sort of way or admired uh, that completely broke everything. And then all of a sudden you have this really uh, far-fetched psychological operation that starts to go on uh, as far as Q and QAnon. Mm -hmm. And 
that's why I take such offense at being, and I'm not, you know, I don't try to censor people, but I take deep offense at being called, uh, you know, Q or QS, whatever. Uh, the idea that the military, despite their track record, especially during times of war in regards to uh, crimes against children is uh, saving kids from tunnels underground. And you're fighting the secret war of dark and light from your phone and you're on the side of light. And uh, you know, the military is giving you the location of airplanes. They're giving it to civilians on Twitter and Facebook. I mean, it's a joke, but that just shows that the isolation and shattering someone's worldview is truly a way to just completely break them down, in my opinion. That's my conspiracy. I think I don't think that the timing of those things uh, should be ignored because people are still curious. People still want to know, you know, uh, Epstein and Ghislaine are still kind of a meme uh, and everybody mm -hmm. wants to focus on the list. And I'm like, uh, no, you need to be asking them where the videotapes are because I'm convinced that they put the list meme uh, out for everybody to kind of keep everyone running in a circle and we're fed little uh, drippings here and there of this person and this person. Uh, this isn't the first time that this has been done and they have those tapes. That's what they're hiding. Oh, period. no doubt. No doubt. Uh, those tapes are still in existence, whether or not they are still in the same location uh, is the only question. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because the only other person that I have heard uh, say something similar is one of our mutual followers uh, over on the X Twitter app. Uh, that, of course, being Doom Mad Villain, uh, who said oh, yeah. the exact same thing just a couple of days ago. Uh, and that tweet. Yeah, Mad Villain's know, awesome. He, it, that tweet went nowhere. It just died. Because like, people right don't was. care. Well, I think it's part of that. And I think it's also part of the, the digital suppression that takes place in the social ghettos. Because that is, that is uh, the one place where the parasites can have absolute control over everybody. They can put whatever restrictions or whatever amplifications they want onto you. And you can't do a goddamn thing about it. I think that's fair. I think, I think that's very fair. And it's a good point. Cause I mean, I'm banned from streaming for hate speech or whatever. Um, my sort of, uh, my only count and I'm only playing devil's advocate. That's all I'm doing. I agree with you, but I ask people, do you know what the Franklin scandal is? Mm -hmm. Do you know what the call boy scandal is? Uh, cause people like to point at one side of the body politic versus the other. And I say, if you don't know about that and you don't know about what happened to Craig Spence and Craig Spence was the original Epstein. He was the predecessor, highly high, high technology, for, especially for that time. And he was murdered. You know, he did not uh, disappear himself. Uh, there were people doing this way before the Clintons ever came into existence. Uh, and yes, you know, Epstein and Ghislaine were running in their circles, so to speak, but that was a very high level operation as well. If people don't understand that and that there were videos, audio destroyed, people murdered, 15 people murdered for that, just the Franklin scandal alone. Mm -hmm. And no one got punished except for a couple of the victims who went to prison, uh, you know. Stop asking about the list. Please ask for the tapes. Not that they're going to give it to us, but we should uh, just kibosh the list. It's a dead end. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Excuse me. And uh, I did not realize when, uh, when we scheduled this that today, August 10th, is actually the four-year anniversary of uh, Epstein didn't kill himself. So uh, if you already knew that at home and you're scoring along, mark down a bonus point for yourself. So, I didn't know that either. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I wasn't paying attention. Yeah, I did not learn that until, again, until I opened Twitter this morning and saw somebody else had commented on it. I was like, oh, yeah, I guess it is about that time of year, isn't it? Wow. Isn't yeah. that fascinating? Yeah. 
And I think in a month, it'll be the anniversary of uh, Johnny Gosh getting kidnapped. So yeah. it's kind of a weird time of year. But it's, it's kind of that time of year. It's, it's the, uh, the lead in to uh, the spectacular uh, autumn programming season. Uh, as I learned when I was uh, very, very young back in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, we have a lot of fireworks to look forward to the rest of this year, uh, I think, folks. Uh, so you might want to uh, prepare yourselves mentally and physically for that. So, Dana, what do you ultimately hope to accomplish uh, with this work that you've been doing? If I'm being completely honest, um my goal would ultimately be, I want to just completely blow the lid on the false memory syndrome thing, the false memory syndrome foundation. That's still my ultimate goal. Um, but obviously jollies in everything, right? So of course, uh, but I can tie, I'm going to tie that in because it comes into everything. False memory syndrome foundation directly ties in with UFOs and aliens. I have that on record. It ties in directly sort of, but, you know, Dershowitz specifically with Epstein and Ghislaine. I mean, this touches everything. So that would be my ultimate goal because uh, there are still people out here, uh, professional or just uh, lay persons, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, I'm just using a common term, um, who don't think that the satanic panic uh, was real. They think that it was, you know, this uh, narrative uh, and it was fake. And when you learn that it wasn't and that a lot of really terrible things happened because people didn't ask questions and they just listened to the news and let the news tell them what to think. Uh, I want to blow the whole lid off of it because I think that that's uh, one of the really big pillars to the uh, sort of military pharma industrial complex because they really need to have access to vulnerable children and that was such a test of what can we get away with in my opinion and so that's that's my personal goal well i sincerely hope that you succeed in achieving that Thanks. goal and anything that uh, we can do here at Liberty Radio in service of that achievement, uh, please do not hesitate to let us know anytime you want to come back on the show with uh, new research. Uh, just just let me know and uh, we'll get it okay. scheduled. So I do have a question from the Liberty Radio community for you. Uh, it's actually a, a question and, and several follow up questions depending on the first answer. But this comes from AJ in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel, uh, who I'm still not convinced is not Alex Jones. Uh, <laughs> have you come across uh, William Sargent in your research? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I've got William Sargent's book, but I'm uh, going through and I'm highlighting everything because okay. it's painful for people on my channel when I'm just... Like, okay, guys, here we, here we go. I've got a highlight, you know, because I try to show people uh, the consistency and the repetition of what these mm -hmm. people say. There it is again. There it is again. But, oh, yes, I've got him. Okay. So follow up to that question. Have you found a British connection or what you might call a special relationship between the CIA and MI5, MI6, Tavistock, that whole complex? Oh yeah, there's a lot of really weird stuff, uh, specifically with uh, L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> so um, it's, I have such a long way to go. I really do. Cause there's so many different angles that you can come at this from, but uh, I mean, keep in mind, you know, a lot of these cults went global pretty early on, right? Uh, cults, church, whatever you want to call it. Um, and like I said, Jolly himself said that he was, you know, at every single base consulting as a psychiatrist for a long time uh, prior to his official resume starting at Tavistock. Um, so Jolly's going to be a little bit tougher specifically because he's so heavily redacted, but 
that's when everybody critically thinks and we can kind of deduce from his resume, his work, everything else and try and figure it out. But, oh yeah, there's, there's some solid ties, at least definitively uh, from L. Ron Hubbard, for sure. Nice, nice. Well, I look forward to uh, those being revealed in upcoming live streams on your channel. Uh, or if they've already been revealed, I look forward to watching the replays. because I, I still haven't uh, been able to consume every minute of your work yet, but it is on my list. Uh, so that will definitely add some views for you. And hopefully this interview will do the same as well. Final question from AJ in the Liberty Radio Telegram channel. Uh, where do you think Jolly West's inspiration came from? I think it came from Hughes Crichton, the founder of Tavistock. His original book, his uh, staple was hypnotism and disease. And that man also had a, I would say, unwarranted sense of confidence, uh, maybe a bit of a Napoleon complex, because he states that he is convinced that this book needs to be put out and that this needs to be done. And it's all him. Um, and obviously, you know, hypnotism and mesmerism and things of that nature, you know, that all dates back. That's fine. But Crichton is the founder of Tavistock. He is also the one that wrote hypnotism and disease specifically. And that is Jolly's career primarily is hypnotism, drugs, and torture. That's a hell of a career for uh, a musician, yeah. much less a psychologist. Yeah, uh, he's he's certainly not a uh, civil rights activist, as <laughs> one recent PR campaign has stated. But are you serious? I digress. So oh, I'm dead actually serious. tried to call that's, him a civil rights activist. That's when I lost it. And I was like, oh, no, I said, we're going on a deep. This is the only time that I will use the term debunking is right now, because uh, this ex Scientology author stated that. Jolly West was a civil rights activist and an advocate for the abolishment of the death penalty. Uh, he cites his work with Martin Luther King and uh, Jimmy Shaver, that case, as well as Patty Hearst. And I said, no, 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 no. I said, sir, I said, I want to talk about why the rest well, three other members from the False Memory Syndrome Foundation were also on Patty Hearst's defense team. So let's talk about that. I said, let's also talk about MK Ultra and Donald DeFreeze. I said, if you want to call him a civil rights activist, we got to talk about the Violence Prevention Center man because he wanted to put brain chips in young Black kids and isolate them because he thought that they were the most violent. And he wanted to be able to predict their violence. And as far as against the death penalty, again, Jimmy Shaver, Patty Hearst. I think that I think that that was when he felt a modicum of guilt was because he saw the fruit, the rotten fruit of his work. Mm. Uh, but that certainly didn't stop him. Speaking of rotten fruit, uh, that brings me to a question that I wasn't necessarily going to put on the slate today, but we might as well, right? Because uh, I, I have a feeling it's going to be an entertaining answer. The name of your channel rotting jewels where does that come from um so there's this band that me and my best friend who's no longer here uh called the blood brothers very uh like screamo sort of metal but it's just a lyric from uh, one of their songs like one of our favorite songs of theirs uh she passed away a couple years ago so it's actually not anything super creative but uh some people some people make some very funny jokes about family <laughs> jewels or rotting fruit or this and that. So, yeah. Well, I thought it was a, a very original title for a channel. Uh, so definitely oh, kudos, kudos for that because it gets people thinking and it gets people asking questions. They're like, I don't usually see those two words together. What does it mean? Uh, and, and I appreciate those types of uh, language games. So Thanks. For personal edification, uh, who creates your production elements? Oh, it's just me. I, I do. I do all my stuff. Oh, wow. They're quite good. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. I, uh, 
yeah, I ride the struggle bus for sure. Um, and I want to get, get, get a little bit nicer, uh, setup going, but you know, I, I feel that I'm not long for the YouTube world, so we'll see how that pans out, but I knew that going in. So it's fine. Cause I'm not going to censor myself. I refuse to, I think that people have been censoring themselves long enough, especially, uh, stuff with the satanic panic and the false memory syndrome foundation, obviously, you know, when I go on other shows, uh, I, I be mindful and I ask, but, uh, when you're coming onto my channel, I'm going to say the dirty words that people don't want to say because it makes you, it puts it into your mind and then you, and I make people read it. That's why I pull it up on the screen. You know, it's not just me, uh, popping off at the mouth. This is a matter of public record. Read it for yourself. And for anybody who still doesn't understand what the true purpose of censorship is, it's not about controlling your speech. It is about controlling your thoughts because when you control what people are and aren't allowed to say, you by proxy control what they are and are not allowed to think about. Uh, so that was uh, one of the main reasons that Liberty Radio came into existence in the first place was so that we could all have a place where we could say whatever the hell we wanted to uh, and not have to worry about uh, what the possible social implications of those strings of words might be. Well, Dana, I certainly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule, although maybe not as busy this week as usual, uh, but I certainly appreciate That's true. you. <laughs> we appreciate you taking the time to join us here on Liberty Radio. My final question for you today, unless I can think of something else in the next couple of minutes, uh, what do you plan to focus on next? So once Jolly West has a bow on him, what's, what has the next target? Oh, I don't think Jolly's ever going to have a bow, quite frankly. Um, you know, it's Hubbard, 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 because Jolly with the ex cult community and now all this really strange happenings that I've uh, stumbled upon within the ex-Scientology community on YouTube. Um, I think that I've got my work cut out for me. I think that there has been a massive disinformation campaign about Hubbard himself. Uh, the ex, again, they like to focus on the money aspect and it's very superficial. Uh, lots of money, lots of crimes being talked about no real regulation. I think that's super weird. I personally think that they've started a new cult um, or they're running controlled opposition and moving finances out of the main church and putting it under a charity organization so that nobody asks questions. Uh, and I think that that is the purpose of that show that Leah Remini and Mike Rinder had, but that's just my two cents. Um, but I think looking at Hubbard specifically and then West and kind of following them and also looking at, because I'm going to do a very, very deep, deep dive on Mr. Jack Parsons, because nice. I do think that Hubbard was involved in his death specifically. Hmm. So what leads you uh, to that suspicion? If you don't mind me asking. There's just a lot of weird stuff that was going on, man. I, I have to, I have to be able to like lay it out for people with the paper with all of the FOIA stuff in front of me, but the fact that he was on the suicide squad and they did so many experiments and then he's getting that shipped should be controlled and it just explodes. Okay. I'm sorry. Plus all the weird stuff with, um, the theosophy and the lima and crowley mm -hmm. uh sci you know ex scientology too they really don't like to talk about that stuff either uh i think that it would be foolish for people to not see the blatant parallels of occultism specifically satanism with scientology i'm not saying that to be dramatic there's just a lot of parallels between the two. Uh, I don't think that Elvron's time with Jack Parsons is some strange aberration at all. And eventually, I guess I'll say it here because I'm not going to be able to stream for a while. So 
I'll tell you the secret. Um, I haven't proven it, but I'm working on it. Uh, I personally think that there's an argument to be made. And I'm going to make it, just as I have with Jollyon. I think that there's an argument to be made that uh, L. Ron Hubbard v- might be uh, Michael Aquino's father. Oh, wow. It would make wow. a lot of sense, right? In a lot of ways, yes. Yeah. And that was something that I had not actually considered previously, which is why I find myself at a loss for words uh, at this yeah, particular moment. Yeah, it's a moment. lot. Yeah. It's a lot. I'm not going to put that into uh, into like a threat or anything yet. Um, and I probably won't repeat that. But, you know, there's just a lot of weirdness with Michael Aquino's mom, um, his grandmother, you know, Nobody knows who his dad was. We know that L. Ron was in the UK. Um, it's, I just, I don't know, man. They were all tied into stuff. They really were. Mm. There's, and again, I'm, I'm going to make a timeline. I'm going to keep it as factual as possible. I try not to uh, deal in conjecture with these type of things. I think there's enough weird conspiracies out there, but, you know, the similarities of Scientology specifically with the Church of Satan, with the Temple of Set. It's, it's just becoming too obvious for me to ignore. Hmm. So I, I need to put it all down, you know, onto, onto paper, so to speak. But uh, I think it's something that maybe people will hopefully consider. Well, I will definitely consider it. Um, and matter of fact, I just wrote down some notes, uh, that I thought of that I need to, uh, go and look up on the interwebs myself, but I really think that this is something that more people need to be paying attention to. And that is the interrelationships between the intelligence agencies, the military services, and then these extra governmental bodies that all seem to be incestuous with one another, like what you're pointing out, the, the relationships between uh, like the, uh, the Temple of Set and NASA. Like, wh- why is that even a thing? How does, how does that come about? Like, and, and why aren't people asking these questions? Or if they have, well, why don't we know that the answers that they found? Like, These are the things people really should be looking into if they want to understand uh, how the control structure works. Because it's it's been an open air experiment for the better part of the last 150 years. And the best part about it, if there is a best part, is the people who have been conducting the experiment have been writing their results down and publishing them. And really all you have to do is go and look for them yourself it might take you a little bit of trouble. You might have to put forth some effort, which I know for a lot of people these days, that's asking a lot. But if you do, you will start finding your own answers and then you know you can start doing some of this uh, type of work on your own. Wouldn't you say, yeah, Dana? I, uh, I agree completely. I, I think that there's, there's no excuse. Um, I understand that life is hard for everyone, but uh, excuses aren't going to cut it. You know, if something happens, there's some of us who, you know, and like you said earlier, people, people that are way smarter than you and me combined, um, who have been doing it for way longer. Uh, I'm just trying to add a little bit to the conversation, but I just can't ignore what I know about Jollyon and Tavistock and what I know about the Temple of Set and what I know about the Church of Satan and then you just Scientology gets treated like this really kooky sort of thing. And I'm like, they're immune to so much criminality as far as punishment goes. Uh, and they really do have this sort of perfect, uh, like provocateur blackmail type operation going on, uh, with everybody within the church. So there's something going on there, but I'm hoping, you know, like I said, I'm working on it. So 
we'll see because when it happens i'm sure i'll just be like screaming for an hour on youtube if i actually can track it down or like get it close well speaking of screaming on youtube when does your suspension get lifted i think five days four oh, okay. days so we still got i got, we still got the better part of it to go yeah all right well there is still stuff available for consumption on your youtube channel which of course we have linked down in the show notes and i think that's even for the stream we have that published where else can people connect with your work um i'm also running jewels on instagram that is where the bulk of my videos are um and then i am on twitter at dana duda awesome and uh, we will also get those linked in the replay show notes when that gets published a little bit later today as well. Dana, thank you so much uh, for taking time to help us learn a little bit more about uh, one of the stickiest individuals in the 20th century, that of course being Dr. Louis Jolien West. We are are going to return you to your regularly scheduled life now. Uh, but again, we just wanted to take a moment to show our gratitude for hanging out with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. Awesome. And everyone else, I will see you in about uh, 48 hours for your Saturday night freak out dance party. Until then, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. And uh, go out and do some learning this weekend. Crying out loud. <laughs>